The House will come to order. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Kosnick moves to amend House Bill number 3436, the second engrossment. As amended, the amendment is coded A31. To the author of the amendment, the member from Dakota, Representative Kosnick. Oh, is he even here? <laughs> To the author of the amendment, the member from Dakota, Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Uh, the AA31 amendment uh, deals with uh, a lot of what Representative Tabke talked about when he introduced the bill. Uh, quite a few features inside the policy bill uh, happened to also affect delivery drivers. And what this bill uh, will do is the extremely regressive delivery fee, the delivery tax, uh, that will cost Minnesota families nearly $200 million just in fiscal years uh, 25 to 27. So unless we repeal this unnecessary cost to Minnesotans, it will lead to real consequences and impact uh, tougher decisions for those who can least afford the extra burden to even buy some necessary items. And this is an example of the state government with one party control ir being irresponsible and making life more unaffordable for Minnesota families. Democrats make life harder and more expensive with this delivery tax. It's harder and more expensive for families and small businesses to administer and keep track of. And so I offer the 831 amendment that imposes the delivery tax. Uh, it's a regressive tax. It will negatively impact families. It's undue burden on businesses to administer. And the Department of Revenue estimates average persons will have about 48 deliveries per year. So this will lead to uh, real difficult decisions and consequences to those that can least afford it those that maybe rely on deliveries uh, for some necessities, groceries, medicines even, um, some that might not be exempt, uh, but they still need them delivered. And so members, uh, this is an opportunity to not be irresponsible, not make life more unaffordable for Minnesota families. And so I'd ask for a roll call, Madam Speaker. A roll call has been requested. Are there 15 hands? Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. And I would encourage members' support to repeal this very regressive tax. Discussion to the amendment. The member from Anoka, Representative Cagle. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, and so the items that Representative Kosnick just listed off, like groceries, is exempt. Um, basically, any sales taxable item is exempt. You have to make purchases over $100 for this 50 cent road maintenance fee to apply. I've actually looked at my deliveries for this year and I've had one item of the billion Amazon items that I order. Um, I had one Amazon item that was over $100 that the 50 cent um, fee would apply to in my, in my cart. Um, so I want to remind members exactly what the um, delivery fee does. So it funds about 81% of the transportation advancement account, which is a non-constitutionally dedicated fund. So we can use that fund to um, fund small cities, 
town roads, county and state highways, metro counties, large cities, and funding for programs like Meals on Wheels. Um, and so again, I want to remind you that 81% of that transportation advancement account that funds small cities, um, you know, that, that's 81% of it. And so this amendment um, is opposed by small cities and would reduce the amount that small cities would receive by $17 million a year just in, in 25. Um, metro counties would see $23 million in reduction and so on. And I looked at the projects in my county. I have 15 projects in Anoka County right now. Um, Representative Kosnick looks like you have 17 county projects going forward in Dakota County, and that's not to mention all the city, small cities, um, and state highway um, aid, and all the other things that this um, this transportation advancement account funds. So I would suggest members um, vote no. Further discussion. Representative Kosnick. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and members. Uh, the actual distribution of these funds have not even gone out yet, is my understanding. Uh, if Representative Cagle would yield for a question. Representative Cagle will yield for a question. Representative Kosnick. Uh, Representative Cagle, has the funds accumulated in this account been distributed to any local um, units of government? Representative Cagle. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And Representative Kosnick, um, if you, it was 25, fiscal year 25, so the um, the delivery fee starts in um, July 1st of this year, and we will collect $11 million on that. Um, so metro counties will get $4 million, small cities will get $3, um, town roads will get $1.2, and um, county state highway will get $1.1 in this fiscal year. In 25, it will be um, 63.8 is the projected in 25, and 14.95 from the transfer of the auto part sales tax. So um, the transportation account, or the transportation advancement account will have $78 million is, um, in 2025, which would give us um, 28 million for metro counties. It would give us 21 million for um, small cities. And so this is the forecast that we got last year. And so that's what I'm going off of. Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I won't ask uh, Representative Cagle to, to yield again to clarify, uh, but give me a wink or a nod if I misunderstood you, but I think you said the tax for deliveries does not start until July 2025. Okay, it, it's confusing because I, th I thought you said you already charged the tax, but it underscores this has been done in other states, mainly Colorado, I want to point out, and it hasn't been administered or run very well. They are continuing to fix this, uh, their delivery tax in Colorado, um, and we may have some similar problems here. So members, nobody's received a dime of this tax yet, and we are providing another opportunity to the Democrats who are making life harder and more expensive for Minnesotans. This is another opportunity for government not to be irresponsible, for government to not be unaffordable. This is, in fact, another opportunity that you can make it easier and less expensive for Minnesotans. We blew through a $20 billion surplus, and we didn't prioritize the core functions of government. We didn't need another tax on hardworking families and Minnesotans. We could have prioritized surplus that Minnesotans paid into to provide a core function of some of the things, uh, building our roads and infrastructure, and you chose not to. Instead, you were irresponsible with the $20 billion surplus, and you made life more expensive by adding $10 billion in more taxes, and most of them were in transportation. It wasn't even in the tax bill. And you made life harder for Minnesotans. I'm actually looking forward to getting out and adjourning in a couple weeks and talking to Minnesotans who are suddenly going to see their gas taxes increased. They're going to see delivery taxes on their purchases. And there will be things that they need and that they eat and consume that are going to be taxed. 
and it's going to be, we're, going to, we're, we're probably going to be here next session tweaking the mechanisms of your irresponsible and unaffordable delivery tax. When we're talking to our constituents, they're going to understand who made it harder and more expensive on their family budgets. But I'm trying to offer you an opportunity to say, hey, we kind of misprioritized that. We can use other dollars. We've got the finance bill coming up. You can make a correction. I'm giving you an opportunity to say we made a mistake. And here's an opportunity for all the members here in this body to say we chose not to raise your taxes about $200 million, and we repealed an irresponsible and an unaffordable delivery tax. So I'm offering you an opportunity to do that today, and it's just common sense. If you vote against this amendment, I think it's safe to say that Democrats are making life harder and more expensive with irresponsible and unaffordable one-party control. Further discussion? Representative Cagle. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, you know, I can make a lot of blanket statements about policies that I don't agree with as well. Um, but, you know, I worked really hard with the authors of the Colorado bill to learn lessons from them. I, I worked hard on this, and I learned lessons from them. I would have really liked the start date, start date to be January 2024, but I worked with stakeholders who were opposed to this and gave them a, a, um, a, a longer um, implementation time. Um, and this is something that DUR says that we can do. So um, I think the thing that's really um, hard on people's budgets are the unexpected car repairs that they need to make. I'm dealing with a, f a seized rotor on my car and all the balance is off because of the wonderful potholes on Pennsylvania, not as bad as last year, but they're there. Um, and so, and then I don't know about you, but um, every day I see Rivian Amazon trucks down my road. Um, and so they're putting more weight on, on the roads in my neighborhood and not paying the gas taxes. And so, um, you know, we need to make sure that our roads are taken care of, not just today, but in the future. And I think the thing that we really forget here is that we're just not reacting to one year. We're looking ahead and we're trying to make sure that our future is stable. And that's what I've been plan trying to do and really looking out for the, um, the whole state of Minnesota. Thank you. Any further discussion? To the author of the amendment, Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'm not sure if uh, Representative Cagle wants to go back and forth and, and uh, debate transportation policy all night, but I'm happy to. I'm guessing our colleagues don't want us to. Um, a lot of the money that's in the transportation advancement account, is a, some of it is Republican ideas of using existing auto parts that we've fought for over the last couple of sessions, and I'm glad we finally did it, and we can use more general fund money. There was also talk about heavy roads. I'm not sure that you worked with uh, Amazon when you passed this bill or other delivery companies, but if you want to talk about heavy cars and vehicles on our roads, how about those heavy cars with batteries? Yeah. 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 <laughs> But the bottom line is this, members. State government under one party control by the Democrats and a tax like this is irresponsible and it's unaffordable. Democrats have made life harder and more expensive for Minnesotans. We're here to make it less expensive and more freedom and more affordable. Please vote yes for the amendment. There being no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll.
The clerk will call the names of the members voting remotely. Curran. There you go. Curran votes no. Curran votes no. Swazinski. The clerk will close the roll. <laughs> there being 58 yeas and 71 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Garofalo moves to amend House Bill number 3436. The second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A46. To the author of the amendment, the member from Dakota, Representative Garofalo. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Would uh, Representative Tapke yield for a question? Representative Tapke will yield for a question. Representative Garofalo. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Tapke. I promise I'm not going to ask you about the village idiot from your district. I promise you I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Um, Representative Tapke, <laughs> um, I just want to know, I don't know if you've been watching the news lately, but I've been kind of keeping my ear on the radio, listening carefully. Uh, the Minneapolis City Council went out and passed this ordinance that's kind of causing some problems. Uh, just as I look at my amendment, I'm trying to address that. Do you think the Minneapolis City Council is going to repeal their infantile, irresponsible, and ineffective uh, rideshare proposition that they've hoisted on the metro area? Representative Tapke. <laughs> I'm not, not sure where the amendment presentation was in there. Uh, it, was there a question on the amendment, Madam Speaker? Representative Tapke, Representative Garofalo, did you have a question on the amendment? Uh, well, Madam Speaker, I'm the author of the amendment, so I don't have a question about my own amendment. I was, the reason why I was asking Representative Tapke is because this amendment um, just says that for the state fair and the planning that's involved, we have to account for the fact that transportation network companies um, are planning on departing and that there's service relocation. So if you're of the opinion that the Minneapolis City Council is going to do the right thing and repeal their infantile uh, ordinance, or if you're of the opinion, and I didn't ask you this before, that the legislature is going to step in and correct this problem, then we probably don't need my amendment. On the other hand, if you think that the Minneapolis City Council is going to hold the state hostage and keep things the way they are, or that the legislature is not going to take action, then you should probably adopt my amendment so the state fair planning can uh, account for the fact that we'll be lacking rideshare services. It's not a question, it's more of a statement, Representative Tapke. I'd ask members to support my amendment, and I would ask you to do the same. Thank you. Discussion on the amendment. Representative Tapke. Uh, Madam Speaker and Representative Garofalo, thank you for the amendment. Yes, I hope that uh, work continues from all parties to get a resolution figured out that we can uh, move forward with TNCs. And uh, I urge a no vote on this amendment simply because it's duplicative. We have uh, it already in the bill. It says that uh, we will improve. The state fair needs to improve support for ride hailing and transportation network companies and just uh, urge everyone to continue working together on this issue to find a solution for it all and uh, to vote no on the amendment. Representative Garofalo, back to the author of the amendment. Okay. All those in favor of the amendment say aye. aye. Those opposed say nay. No. The motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Olson B moves to amend House Bill number 3436. The second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A38. To the author of the amendment, the member from, from Martin, Representative Olson. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. For far too long, this legislative body has abdicated its authority to make laws. We have given away the authority that's been invested in us through our Constitution, and we've said to the executive branch that they can make laws in our stead. It's laziness, members. 
I, don't, I know I don't need to give you an education lesson here on checks and balances. Our government, the United States government and subsequently the state of Minnesota's government, was based on an idea of checks and balances. And throughout all of our history, we have seen these branches jostling for power. The executive branch will do something, and the legislative branch counters, and then the Supreme Court, the judicial branch, jumps in and makes a change. Everyone's moving, checking, and balancing each other. But here in the state of Minnesota, we have completely abdicated our authority to check the executive branch. We have told them on numerous occasions, you do our job for us. We'll just sit in our chairs. Every once in a while, we'll press a green button. Maybe we'll press a red button. Maybe someone will stand up and say something. And at the end of the day, the executive branch can make all the decisions. We'll let our agencies make this happen. We'll let the governor make this change for us. And we don't have to vote on it. Now, members, this amendment is entirely bringing back the power to the legislative branch for one particular reason. When we're talking about our clean energy fuel standard, this, this working group that has been discussing potentially an important topic, we, through this amendment, need to ensure that we have the overall authority on it. Our fingerprints need to be on it. We need to take responsibility as a legislative body to do our job. I can think of a number of times throughout the last uh, year or two in which we have continually provided others with the ability to do our job for us, mandating reports from agencies to us when we could just do the work ourselves. Or how about this one, allowing 13 members of a commission to determine an identifying state symbol for all five million Minnesotans. Another time when we just said, do our job for us. We don't want to do it anymore. Members, why are you here if you wish to give our agencies more power? Why are you here if you want the executive branch to have more power? Just go work for them. Some of you have already done it. This amendment will provide legislative authority to approve or deny any potential clean energy standard that is recommended. It is a safeguard to protect the checks and balances, the integrity of this body into the future. This has nothing to do with the clean energy standard itself, which I'm not going to talk about how many states that have adopted these kind of standards have seen massive increases on the price of gas to include up to 50 cents. I'm not going to talk about that. That's not what this amendment is about. The amendment's not about how regressive uh, an increase on fuel is for the lowest income members of this state. I'm not going to mention that. I'm just going to advocate that we as a body take responsibility, refuse to abdicate our positions, and actually do our jobs. That is what this amendment is for, and I hope that everyone will stand up to do their job one more time. Please vote yes on this amendment. Madam Speaker, point of order. State your point of order. Uh, point of order under rule 3.21, the topic of this amendment, carbon emission standards, I'm not actually sure, um, is not included in the bill, and the amendment attempts to bring in a topic that's not in the underlying bill, so I would ask you to find this amendment not germane and approve the point of order. Madam Speaker, advice. Advice. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I would like to point out that Representative Agbaji didn't even know what this amendment was. She said it's some clean standard. So if she doesn't know what the amendment is, she obviously cannot provide you advice as to whether or not it fits within the transportation policy bill. Madam if Speaker. she doesn't know what it is, she cannot possibly <laughs> Madam Speaker. educate the speaker on it. Thank Madam you, Speaker. Madam Speaker. Representative Agbaje. Madam Speaker, Representative Bjorn is bringing in personalities into this. I, he clearly did not bring up his amendment. It does not meet what the topics are under this underlying bill. And so I would ask you to find my point of order in, in order. Advice. Representative Bjorn. Rem <laughs> <laughs> Representative Olson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It is a really cool name. I'm very pleased and thankful to my parents for providing me with that name. Um, so that is, that is more than okay. Thank you. Um, 
that it most certainly may in fact be personalities, but that is who I am, so I'll take it. Uh, Madam Speaker, if we as a body don't know what we're talking about, we cannot provide you with the advice that is necessary to make an educated decision for the state of Minnesota. It's not about this amendment. It's not about whether or not we don't want to take a vote to abdicate our position. It's about what is right. And if we cannot provide you with the adequate advice, identifying that we as a body know what we are talking about, we cannot in good point faith order, Madam Speaker. get rid of this. State your point of order. Uh, Mason's 124 personalities. I'd urge you to uh, ask the member to avoid personalities in debate. Representative Olson, please avoid personalities. Thank you. We as a body, Madam Speaker, are one entire personality or are we multiple individuals when I'm saying we as a body? We as a body, every member of this organization, if they do not know what they are talking about, if we collectively have no idea what the basis of this amendment is, we cannot advise you. I would ask, Madam Speaker, that you find someone over there who can provide advice as to why this is out of order. Members, I am prepared to rule, and Representative Olson, I did actually look at it beforehand, too, and so I have actually studied the amendment, I have reviewed the bill, and I've considered your advice, and I am ruling that the point of order is well taken. Madam Speaker, I would like to appeal the ruling of the Speaker and ask for a roll call vote. Are there 15 hands? Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call vote. The question before the body is, shall the, shall the decision of the speaker stand as the judgment of the House? A yes or green vote supports the ruling of the speaker. A no or red vote goes against the ruling of the speaker. Members, just reminding again that a yes or green vote supports the ruling of the speaker and a no or red vote goes against the ruling of the speaker. All those in favor. Madam, Madam Speaker, I'd ask for a roll call vote on this. Representative Olson, that is correct. Actually, there, you did already request the roll call. There was already 15 hands, so the clerk will take the roll. Will the clerk call the names of the members voting remotely? Kern. There you go. Kern votes aye. Kern votes aye. Swazinski. Swazinski votes no. Swazinski votes no. The clerk will close the roll. There being 70 yeas and 61 nays, it is the judgment of the House that the decision of the Speaker shall stand. There are no more amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House Hall number 3436, as amended. Third reading. Discussion. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And, and we've had a long debate about this, this bill. And, and I just wanted to say to Representative Tabke that you really did a, a large job here. Uh, you took three agency policy bills plus additional bills and put them into, into one. And you accepted some of our amendments, uh, but certainly rejected most of them. 
And so, um, whereas the, the bill as a whole is a, is a very acceptable bill, it left out some great opportunities that we had to make it even better. Uh, and we tried to help you with that. So it, it may not be as good as it could be. It is still a very good bill, and I will certainly be supporting the bill. Thank you for it. Further discussion? To the author of the bill, Representative Tapke. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and thank you very much to everyone for the discussion on this bill. This uh, bill has a lot of really great points in it that will help our uh, will help our state patrol, will help our uh, deputy registrars, will help folks making sure that a lot of the issues that we talked about today will be getting better because of this bill. And so I really appreciate everyone's conversation. Again, to the committee and to Chair Hornstein and the Lead, Pe Lead Petersburg and all of our staff uh, that worked really hard to get us to this point. I appreciate everyone's work and encourage a green vote. So thank you very much. There being no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll. <laughs> Members, please vote. The clerk will call the names of the members voting remotely. Kern. Here you go. Kern votes aye. Kern votes aye. Swazinski. Swazinski votes aye. Swazinski votes aye. The clerk will close the roll. There being 97 yeas and 34 <coughs> nays, the bill is passed as amended and it's titled Agreed To. The next bill on the calendar for the day is House File 3454. The clerk will report the bill. <clears throat> House File number 3454, number five on the calendar for the day, an act relating to the military, the first engrossment. I recognize the author of the, there are no amendments, there are no amendments at the desk. I rep recognize the author of the bill, the member from Anoka, Representative Norris. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, it's an honor to carry the Department of Military Affairs policy bill on behalf of the House Veterans and Military Affairs Committee. I love the bipartisanship and the collegiality among the members of our committee. Whether it's supporting those who serve us here at home and abroad in the Minnesota National Guard or taking care of our veterans who have honorably served, it's a privilege to sit on the committee and do this important work. This year's policy bill is a mix of technical fixes and new tools to help the Minnesota National Guard carry out its mission. It incorporates all the changes that the Department of Military Affairs requested. Even though most of these changes may be technical in nature, they bring clarity and security to the Minnesota National Guard. It includes some clarifying language regarding the Adjutant General's authority to contract with the federal government and rent out National Guard facilities. It adds new protections to National Guard facilities. Currently, Minnesota statutes prohibiting the unauthorized presence on military institutions only applies to Camp Ripley. This bill expands it to the other 80 training areas and facilities under the authority of the Guard. The Minnesota National Guard is a criminal jurisdiction and sometimes has greater need for access to investigative data from other agencies. This bill helps them achieve that, especially as a secondary jurisdiction, by providing statutory clarification for other agencies, and it cleans up some existing statutory language to help clarify the sorts of data that the Adjutant General can request from other agencies about service members. And lastly, it includes language allowing the Adjutant General to set up a referral bonus program. Under the program, existing members of the, of the Guard would get a bonus for referrals that lead to enlistment in or commissioning into the Minnesota National Guard. We amended it in committee in a collaborative manner to ensure clear reporting and safeguards. When I think of this provision, one of my favorite constituents to visit when I'm out door knocking comes to mind. 
He's a recruiter for the military, and I love going to his door to thank him for his service and pick his brain about what the recruiting landscape looks like and how we as policymakers can help him in his mission. The reality is that this is one of the toughest recruiting environments in about two decades. The good news is that the Minnesota National Guard continues to be a national leader in filling our ranks but we can't rest on our laurels. So this referral bonus program will give people like my constituent another tool to make sure there are Minnesotans stepping up to serve our state and our nation. I want to thank Representatives Clardy, Coulter, Hudella, and Olson B for authoring provisions in this legislation before us. This is a good bipartisan bill, and I urge all members to support it. The clerk will give the bill a third reading. Third reading, House File number 3454. Third reading. Discussion to the bill. The, me the member from Anoka, Representative Newton. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. This is a, a solid bill. It's a good bill that had uh, support of the entire uh, Veterans Committee, and I urge a green vote. Thank you. Further discussion? Seeing no further discussion uh, to the bill author, Representative Norris. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, this bill and Representative Olson's VETS bill are expected to be the two primary pieces of legislation coming out of our committee this year. So I'd like to take just a brief moment to thank the many staff members who have served our committee so admirably. Uh, that includes Colby Sullivan from House Research, Helen Roberts from House Fiscal, Alex Sandgren, our page, John Holtquist from GOP Research, Sean Haydorn from DFL Research, Robin Schmidt, our committee legislative assistant, and Jack Dockendorf, our committee administrator. I also want to extend a huge thank you and a shout out to our fearless leader, Chair Jerry Newton, a veteran himself, he sets the collaborative and bipartisan tone for our committee with a focus on serving our guardsmen and women and vets rather than silly partisan fights. I'm not sure which was longer and more distinguished, his many years serving America in the military or his decades of service in public office. All of us on the committee benefited from your leadership, Chair Newton. Coming from the neighboring district, I consider you a mentor and a friend and appreciate you showing this political rookie the ropes. Finally, a heartfelt expression of gratitude to my colleagues on the committee. With the exception of maybe the Capital Investment Committee, we have the opportunity to travel the state uh, probably more than any other committee, whether it's going to Camp Ripley, visiting the 148th Fighter Wing up in Duluth, or the Minneapolis Veterans Home. It gives us a lot of opportunities to spend some quality time together getting to know each other, and it's been an honor to serve with you doing this important work. Members, I urge you to join me in supporting this bill and in the process, our men and women in uniform. Let's light up the board green. There being no further discussions, the clerk will take the roll. The clerk will call the names of the members voting remotely. <clears throat> Kern. There you go. Kern votes aye. Kern votes aye. Swazinski. Swazinski votes aye. The clerk will close the roll. There being 130 yeas and zero nays, the bill is passed and it's titled agreed to. The last bill on the calendar for the day is House File 4334. The clerk will report the bill. House, House file number 4334, number six on the calendar for the day, an act relating to veterans, the first engrossment. To the author of the bill, the member from Martin, Representative Olson. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. And thank you to Representative Norris for thanking everyone on the committee so I don't have to spend that amount of time doing so again. Uh, my heartfelt gratitude to Chair Newton for the wonderful committee that he ran this year. Uh, it's very, very telling that if you want to get a job done right and on time, have a Command Sergeant Major do it, right? So we so appreciate the, commit the committee that you ran this year. We are going to miss you so very much in the future. Uh, more people like you need to need to be in this building doing the work of the people because you emulated absolutely so from my the bottom of my heart thank you for your service to our state and to our country as well this bill does three things and they're very simple the first one is it couples the state of minnesota with the federal government when it talks about the forfeiture of military benefits for committing crimes all right i need you all to understand that when we're talking about these crimes, these are very high level crimes. Currently, the federal government has a way in which we can strip veterans of their benefits should they be convicted of high level crimes such as treason or mutiny or impersonating an officer under the UCMJ code or attempting to defraud the government. Another item uh, would be colluding with foreign nations. These are all high level crimes that absolutely warrant the stripping of military benefits that these soldiers, these veterans have earned. Very high level crimes. In the state of Minnesota, we are unable to strip our state benefits from those veterans. So the federal government can convict someone of a crime, a high level crime that, that removes them from qualification for these benefits, but the state cannot. And so what this bill will do, it will, it will couple the federal government's determination of what would allow you to remove soldiers and veterans from their benefits with the state. Changes nothing else. It just says if the federal government does this, we can do it too, which is the right thing to do. The second thing that we have on this involves the administrators of veterans' homes. It just changes some languages in saying that they do not answer to the commissioner. It says they are appointed, they have this job, and they don't answer to the commissioner. That's how it, that's how it works, just cleans up some of the language. And lastly, we have a new authorization for a veterans cemetery in northwestern Minnesota. It's an authorization, it has no spending involved. There's a long list of things that need to occur before we have this cemetery created, but we are of the opinion that no family should have to drive more than two hours away to visit their loved ones who have been who have served our nation and are now buried in a state cemetery. Those are the three things that this, this, this bill does. It's a very good, easy vote for everyone who supports our military and our armed services and our veterans here in the state of Minnesota. I absolutely urge a green vote. Thank you. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Hudella moves to amend House Law number 4334, the first engrossment. The amendment is coded A3. To the author of the amendment, the member from Dakota, Representative Hudella. Madam Speaker, members, right now, if you're serving in the military, let's say you're coming up on the end of that 20 years of service, you've likely deployed numerous times, you're coming back to Minnesota and you want to find a job. So you find a state job, you go to apply for it. Currently under statute, you cannot claim veterans benefits or veterans preference because of, because of a technicality that you're not discharged yet. It's dumb. It's as dumb as the Uber and Lyft problem that we're having in Minneapolis right now. <laughs> My bill is just a simple technical fix that says Minnesota will adopt what the federal government has adopted and the majority of states have adopted that says if you're within 120 days of getting out of the military and you would otherwise qualify for veterans preference for a state job, that your local commander or the military unit that you're assigned to can sign a letter saying yes, we anticipate this individual is gonna be honorably discharged to meet that preference requirement. So hopefully an easy um, vote for everybody and look forward to getting it through. Discussion on the amendment. The member from Anoka, Representative Newton. 
Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and uh, thank you, uh, Representative Hudella, for bringing this amendment forward. It's a good amendment. Uh, we just have to work with the Senate to make sure that it's attached to the bill. And Representative Olson, I want to thank you for carrying this bill. Uh, it's been a pleasure serving on this committee with uh, so many great members. So uh, thank you, and I encourage us to accept the bill, uh, the amendment, uh, as a friendly amendment, and that we all pass the bill by a vote in green. Thank you. Representative Olson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This here today is proof that there is such a thing as a friendly amendment. Please accept it. There being no further discussion, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. aye. Those opposed say nay. The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Third. Third reading. Third reading, House Hall number 4334, as amended. Third reading. Discussion. <laughs> the member from Beltrami, Representative Bliss. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, th this is a great bill. I'm. I'm obviously going to support it. I just wanted to stand up and say what a great group we had in this committee, led by our uh, fearless leader, uh, uh, Representative Newton, over there. And it, it has been an honor, Representative Newton. Um, just to show how bipartisan he is, how often do you see a, a member of the other party carry a, an omnibus or a minibus? Uh, but that just shows you that we, you know, how, how we are. And, and I just hope that the next chairman that we have, whatever party it is, uh, carries the same. Uh, philosophy you do that it, you, you leave your R's and your D's at the door we work for the veterans and that's who we are so I just want to uh, encourage support for this bill and, and thank uh, Representative Newton for his service thank you further discussion to the author of the bill Representative Ol uh, Olson thank you Madam Speaker thank you again everyone for your support for this bill it is a good bill that supports our military and our veterans I urge a green vote there being no further discussions, the clerk will take the roll. Remember who the member is. Will the clerk call the names of the members voting remotely? Kern. Here you go. Kern votes aye. Kern votes aye. Swazinski. Swazinski aye. Swazinski votes aye. The clerk will close the roll. There being 131 yeas and zero nays, the bill is passed as amended and its title agreed to. Motions and resolutions. There are copies of the non-controversial motions and there are copies of the non-controversial motions at the House desk and online. If there is no objection, we will take action on those motions first. Hearing no objections, the motion prevails. <clears throat> Brand moves that House Hall number 3896 be recalled from the Committee on Transportation, Finance, and Policy and be re referred to the Committee on Commerce, Finance, and Policy. The member from Nicolette, Representative Brand. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yes, my motion is to um, take this bill and move it to the Commerce Finance Policy to give it a hearing. I've spoken to both <coughs> chairs and the uh, representative uh, Chair Hernstein and Chair Stevenson, and both agreed to have it moved to the Commerce Committee. Um, what the bill does, it's, it's an re act relating to railroads. What it does is it allows um, insurance coverage requirements to be changed. We haven't updated that since 2010. For motor carriers of railroad employees, and it also creates some civil penalties, which we heard in commerce today. So that's my motion. Discussion. Yeah. Representative Petersburg. In my hand. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I was just going to ask if you would explain the, the um, actual amendment, and he did. Thank you. Further discussion. Okay. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and th thank you, Representative Brand. Um, this bill is definitely something that should have been in commerce, and just as a point of, of uh, parliamentary clarification here, <laughs> this bill should have been, um, because it deals with insurance, have been in the Commerce Committee long before the deadline. And we're seeing a pattern of this developing. This is not the first time this week that we have found things. And I want to thank my Republican colleagues for pointing this out earlier today in committee. And so there is a remedy that it will at least be heard, albeit after the deadline, that we're following and trying to preserve the integrity of this uh, particular institution's charter and mission. So I want to thank my Republican colleagues for this, and I also want to thank the Democratic uh, colleagues for recognizing this and cooperating with bringing this back to the Commerce Committee where it does need to be vetted out as well. Thank you, members. Any further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, nay. And the motion does prevail. Agbadj moves that House Bill number 4977 be recalled from the Committee on State and Local Government Finance and Policy and be re referred to the Committee on Taxes. The member from Hennepin, Representative Agbadj. Thank you, Madam Speaker. That is my motion. I've spoken with both chairs. Uh, this is a bill that belongs more in taxes than state government. The bill focuses on renewal of the ballpark tax in Hennepin County and defines new uses for the revenue collected. Discussion. Seeing no discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. <clears throat> Any opposed, nay. And the motion prevails. Walgamont moves that House Bill number 4661, now on the General Register, be re referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. The member from Sherburne, Representative Walgamont. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that House Bill <clears throat> 4661 on the General Register be re referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. I spoke with Chair Olson, and she has agreed to support this motion. House File 4661 is the bill that reflects the recommendations of the Workers' Compensation Advisory Council. And the reason why we're making this motion to re refer is because we got the fiscal note earlier this week. Turns out there is actually a net savings to the Workers' Compensation account, but because of that, we want to hear the bill in ways and means. That's my motion. That's why we're referring it, and I would ask for members' support. Discussion. Seeing no discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed, nay. Motion prevails. House concurrent resolution number six is being introduced by uh, Becker Finn and others. House concurrent resolution recognizing wild rice as sacred and central to the culture and health of indigenous people. The concurrent resolution is being referred to the Committee on Rules and Legislative Administration. <clears throat> the, the member from Ramsey, Representative Becker Finn. Uh, yep, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. That is my motion, and look forward to future dis discussion on the resolution. Discussion. <clears throat> Seeing no discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed, nay. nay. And the motion prevails. Garofalo moves that the rules of the House be so far suspended so that House File number 5006 be recalled from the Committee on State and Local Government Finance and Policy, be given its second and third readings, and be placed upon final passage. The member from Dakota, Representative Graflow. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. First, I would request a roll call on my motion. 
Roll call has been requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Uh, thank you. Uh, Madam Speaker and members, as, every, as everyone already knows, uh, recently the Minneapolis City Council passed an ordinance that jeopardizes ride-sharing services for every resident of the City of Minneapolis for both Uber and Lyft and for the entire seven-county metro area for everyone who uses Uber. Now, there are many t uh, reasons that we can possibly have an urgency. Sometimes we have an unexpected crisis. Uh, maybe we have a natural disaster. But in this case, what we have is an urgency that's been created exclusively because it's a Democrat-created crisis. This was simply a crisis that was created for with no rationale behind it at all. This was not necessary. But make no mistake about it, on May 1st, unless this legislative body acts or the Minneapolis City Council reverses their ordinance, hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans will lose access to life-saving transportation services. Now, Madam Speaker and members, there's a report that was issued by uh, the Department of Labor Industry on ride sharing. And I, uh, I guess I'm old fashioned. Um, I, like, I read the report. And I would encourage members of both sides of the aisle to read that report. What you will see in that report is a couple of things. The first is that they report that drivers who currently drive ride sharing in the Twin Cities metro area, when they're driving, experience a medium wa a median wage of over $50 an hour. That's what drivers today are making, over $50 an hour, according to this report. Now, they do some interesting gymnastics in this report in an effort to attempt to claim that the drivers are not being compensated well. And in these so-called recommendations or reports, they assume that a driver who is driving 35,000 miles before they are compensated should be given $33,000 in reimbursable expenses. That's what's in the report right now and is being recommend, recommended. Now beyond that, the Minneapolis City Council goes above and beyond those in, in, in numerous ways that are, uh, result in the destruction of demand for rideshare services, makes it too expensive, and more importantly, engages in so much money going out there that if these compensation rates were at play, I would quit my job and drive Uber, okay? It would be $90 an hour to drive somebody. These would be the highest rates in the nation, higher than Manhattan if they were in, in place. But uh, Madam Speaker and members, I recognize that the night is late and probably no one's watching. So this gives me an opportunity just to talk to my colleagues and uh, let me have this conversation with you instead of having it one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Uh, I've served in the majority and I've served in the minority. And I recognize that when one party is in total control, you kind of get used to it, right? Here's the reality on Uber. You're going to need our help. Just like on the school resource officer bill, you couldn't do it by yourself, you needed Republican votes. Just like on a bonding bill, you can't do it by yourself, you're gonna need Republican votes on sports gambling, very important issue. I believe you're gonna need some Republican votes. And so, members, I just wanna, as we're going ahead here, I wanna recognize that what is happening right now is all our eggs are being put in one basket. There is a high pressure campaign on the Minneapolis City Council to flip their votes, to get four members to flip over and reconsider, or perhaps write a new ordinance. And you know what? Um, maybe that'll succeed. Maybe it won't. But Madam Speaker and members, this is too important of an issue to have all our eggs in one basket. There needs to be a plan B. And waiting until May 1st is not acceptable. It's not acceptable for those who use the service. It's not acceptable for those who will lose their jobs for the economic chaos and the transportation nightmares it would cost, those are not acceptable options. So there's many reasons why I'm standing up to declare this urgency today, but I wanna make everyone aware of a narrative that is building out there that I'm very concerned about. And the narrative goes something like this. Well, you know, the city council 
maybe they're not going to overturn the ordinance on the 11th. And maybe they're not going to overturn the ordinance on the 25th. So maybe what has to happen is May 1st, things need to shut down so then the city council can feel the pain and realize the error of their ways. Madam Speaker and members, I don't think that's acceptable. And the reason why it's not acceptable is this. The pain isn't going to be experienced by the city council. The pain is going to be experienced by senior citizens, by children from alternative learning centers who can't get to school, okay? by those who are choosing to go out and socialize and be incentivized to get their car home through drunk driving. There's a lot of bad things that will happen May 1st if we subscribe to a strategy of letting them feel the pain first. And it's something that I'm concerned about. And so as we're going forward uh, with this bill to today, uh, declaring an urgency, I want to make sure that we all understand this is real. Last session, the DFL legislature had an opportunity and voted on a bill that did so many of the things the Minneapolis City Council did. And I would suspect, while not questioning motives, I think that many DFLers felt comfortable voting for that because they knew that Governor Walls was going to veto it. They knew Governor Walls wasn't going to allow this to happen and allow things to shut down. Here's the problem. I'm concerned the Minneapolis City Council thinks the same way about the legislature that you felt about Tim Walls last session. And they're just going to count on us to fix this. Now, I stand ready to help you with that, and many of my Republican colleagues do, but it is time, it is past time to take this threat seriously, to declare an urgency, and to signal that we need to work together to fix this problem. Madam Speaker and members, I would ask you to vote green on my, this motion to suspend the rules and declare an urgency. Thank you. Discussion. The member from Hepin, Hennepin, Representative Long. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Representative Garofalo, there are two concerns that I think we share here. I hope one is that the reason that we are having this conversation at all, as the report which you so carefully read shows, is that drivers are being underpaid. You cited a number that does not include all of the time that the drivers are putting in. If you include all of the time that they're putting in and their expenses, the report showed that both in the metro and in greater Minnesota, the drivers are being paid below minimum wage, which is what they've been telling us when they come up here. And uh, we, as a state, should not find that acceptable for anyone who is working on our state to be paid below the minimum wage in the state. So we are trying to solve a problem here. While we are trying to solve this problem, we also want to make sure that we are providing services and rides to those who need them, including seniors, including the disabled, including the many who are using transportation network companies for all of their uh, needs. And that is what we are uh, working very hard to achieve. Uh, this would not help us achieve that. This would set us backwards. We need to work together to try to find a common path and solution. Cities do have an important role in this conversation. They are the ones who are licensing these companies. They are overseeing these companies at the local level. Uh, and so we need to be partners with them and we are working hard to find a path that will allow our drivers to be paid adequately and that will keep companies in our state. And so I would ask members to vote no. Representative Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, in closing and in avoiding, avoiding a debate, I guess we have a difference of view of what the role of government is in determining the wages of those who are self-employed. We have a philosophical difference on that. But one thing that we should be all be able to agree on is that right now, this is a very risky strategy to assume that the Minneapolis City Council is going to do the right thing. If they don't repeal their ordinance, we are going to have to preempt them with a statewide standard. Whatever that standard is, that's what's going to happen. And I will tell you, there is no way you can do this with DFL-only votes. Okay, you're going to need our help. We're here to help you. We did it on the school resource officer bill and we'll do it again. But you have to include us in the meetings you're having and in the conversations you're having because right now you're not. Members, this is a slowly building crisis. It is a Democrat created crisis. Please help us move forward, vote green. Thank you, Madam Speaker. There being no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll.
<clears throat> Members, please vote. The clerk will call the names of the members voting remotely. Kern. There you go. Kern votes no. Kern votes no. Swazinski. Swazinski, yes. Swazinski votes aye. The clerk will close the roll. There being 62 yeas and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail. Announcements. The member from Stearns, Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, point of personal privilege. That's the first one I've had to do. State your point of privilege. You're fine. You're doing well. Uh, members, tonight seems like a very fitting time to um, do this point of personal privilege. Earlier this evening, bipartisanly, this chamber passed both the Veterans Affairs and the Military Affairs Bill, showing that this chamber supports those in our military. Earlier this week, this nation lost one of the members of the great generation, Lou Conter. You may have heard about him in the news. Lou Conter was the last surviving member of the Navy on the USS Arizona. The ship that was attacked early on Sunday morning, November 7th, 1941, in Pearl Harbor. Hawaii wasn't even a state at that point, it was a U.S. territory. Shortly after the attacks, Conter was drafted into the Navy Flight School, where he accelerated, excuse me, excelled as a pilot, flying over 200 combat missions, facing peril again, being shot down over the New Guinea waters in 1943, fighting for his life. He went on to serve in the Korean War, left the military in 1967, never thinking he was a hero, always pointing back to the other individuals. On the USS Arizona and his partners in, in the military who gave the ultimate sacrifice. On Monday of this week, in Grass Valley, California, at the age of 102, Lou Conter passed away. We've lost yet one more member of the great generation. Would you please join me in a moment of silence, remembering Mr. Conter. Members, please join in a moment of silence. Representative Long. Madam Speaker, I move that when the House adjourns today, it adjourns until 3.30 p.m. Monday, April 8th, 2024. Representative Long moves that when the House adjourns today, it adjourns until 3.30 p.m. on Monday, April 8th. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Representative Long. Madam Speaker, I move that the House do now adjourn. Representative Long moves that the House do now adjourn. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. The motion prevails and the House stands adjourned until 3.30 p.m. on Monday, April 8, 2024.